Journal entry, January 4th, 1909. The main thing against us is the biting wind. Our faces are cut and our feet and hands are always on the verge of frostbite. We are so thin that our bones ache as we lie on the hard snow in our sleeping bags. Too cold to write more. We, on this journey, were already beginning to think of death as a friend. Great God, this is an awful place. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. Those old explorers went to Antarctica a hundred years ago. I bet they have Wi-Fi now. Getting to Antarctica takes like five days. Uh, it's a day of flying with four flights down to the bottom tip of South America, and then it's a four day boat ride over the roughest sea in the world, the Drake Passage. Luckily, I will be traveling with an Antarctic expert named Professor Bill Dietrich. So let's go find him. Bill studies the Antarctic ice fish. Of the 65,000 vertebrae species on Earth, ice fish are the only ones without red blood. For a bunch of reasons that we'll discuss in a later episode, these fish are only found in Antarctica. Bill's current research is trying to predict if the ice fish will be able to survive Antarctica's rapid climate change. The average temperature on the Antarctic Peninsula has risen 6 degrees Celsius in 50 years, making it one of the fastest warming climates on Earth. Bill's done over 20 research trips and he says that living at Palmer Station now is is noticeably warmer than it was at the beginning of his career. But on the bright side, the glacier at Palmer Station has melted so fast that it revealed an entirely new island, which they named after Bill. So don't say nothing good has ever come from climate change. My mom was Googling you. Okay. And she has told me that you have an island named after you. That is true, <laughs> correct, yes. Uh, as of three years ago, I have an island in Arthur Harbor in recognition of the contributions that I've made to polar science. Speaking of polar science, for pretty much all of human history, no one knew what Antarctica was. The first person on record to cite the Antarctic mainland was a Russian explorer in 1820. That's only 200 years ago. Humans have been living on every continent on Earth since before recorded history, except Antarctica. The first person to reach the South Pole only did it 100 years ago. Think about how crazy that is. Magellan sailed around the world in 1522, then it took 400 years before anyone got to the South Pole. And then it took 50 years to get from the South Pole to the moon. The first person to hypothesize a continent at the South Pole was the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. The ancient Greeks had limited knowledge of the Southern Hemisphere, but Aristotle reasoned that its geography would roughly mirror the continents of the Northern Hemisphere. You know, it doesn't make sense that the world would be lopsided. Therefore, there must be a large, undiscovered southern continent to counterbalance Europe and Asia in the north. Aristotle's imaginary southern continent was called Terra Australis. And the crazy thing is, if you look at old maps, it's on, like, all of them for, like, thousands of years. This giant imaginary continent that Aristotle dreamt up in 350 BCE. Fast forward to the 1700s, and explorers are still trying to find Terra Australis 2,000 years later. Some of the European explorers would find southern islands, like New Zealand or Tierra del Fuego, and assume that these islands were actually the northern tip of the fabled southern continent. It wasn't until Captain James Cook sailed his boat all the way around the frozen southern ocean that the myth was finally put to rest. Cook very nearly came within sight of Antarctica, but the Antarctic waters uh, contained too many icebergs at the time, and he was forced to return north. When Cook got home, he predicted that there was probably a continent at the South Pole, but no man would ever reach it because no man would ever sail further south than he. <laughs> All of our cold weather gear has been gotten and we're getting on the ship in about an hour and a half. 
there's one more thing that we have to do, and that is we have to go rub the Statue of Magellan uh, for good luck. The seas in the Drake Passage are uh, probably the roughest on the planet. But in the 1800s, when they were uh, vessels were sailing around Cape Horn, it was fairly common for vessels to sink. So these are very treacherous waters. Rubbing the toe, good luck for the crossing. In 1911, the Norwegian explorer named Raoul Amundsen became the first person to ever reach the South Pole. And he did it in the most dramatic way possible, a literal head-to-head -head race with British explorer Robert Falcon Scott. The race to the South Pole was a contest of national pride, similar to the space race between the United States and the USSR. Scott had been publicly planning his run at the pole, to which he felt entitled by virtue of his prior exploration. Amundsen was planning to conquer the North Pole, but beaten by Perry, he reversed course and showed up in Antarctica unannounced, which the British saw as extremely poor sportsmanship. So the race was on. The two teams were evenly matched, except for one thing. Amundsen had spent a lot of time with the Inuit people of northern Canada, and learned all of their extreme survival skills. That included learning how to properly run sled dog teams. And that, you know, the nice thing about dogs is that they eat meat. Amundsen's plan was to start with way more dogs than he needed, and then as the weaker dogs died, he'd feed them to the strong ones. This way he didn't have to drag any dog food along with him. Scott refused to do that because, you know, puppies are just too cute. And at one point he said, One cannot calmly contemplate the murder of animals which possess such intelligence and individuality, which have frequently such endearing qualities, and which very possibly one has learned to regard as friends and companions. So instead he murdered Siberian ponies. Scott's ponies were not suited for Antarctic exploration. They could not handle the cold of early summer, so Amundsen and his sled dogs got a four-week head start. In addition to that, the ponies were too heavy to walk on top of the snow, so they only survived about a quarter of the journey. That left Scott's team to drag the sleds by hand the rest of the way. Amundsen's expedition went fully according to plan, and he beat Scott to the pole by 34 days. Scott's team spent seven weeks dragging sleds through a frozen wasteland, eating frozen pony meat and sleeping in frozen sleeping bags. The only thing keeping them going, the promise of being the first people to ever touch the South Pole. But then, off in the distance, a black speck in an abyss of white, the Norwegian flag waving in the wind, leading to the most epic disappointment selfie of all time. The pole, yes, but under very different circumstances from those expected. We have had a horrible day. And things only got worse from there. Scott's team encountered extremely bad weather on their return journey. This slowed their pace and they exhausted their food supplies. Eventually the hardships proved too much and team members began falling ill. Lieutenant Bowers and Dr. Wilson were now suffering intensely from snow blindness and Oates's feet were frozen. Captain Oates struggled along for 10 days more, every step being torture to him. He said, I am just going outside and I may be some time. And he staggered out into the raging storm. We knew that poor Oates was walking to his death. And though we tried to dissuade him, we knew it was the act of a brave man and an English gentleman. Exhausted by starvation and suffering, they could do no more. Happy in the knowledge that they died for the honor of their country. Scott has had a bunch of movies made about his doomed journey, but Amundsen barely gets any attention for his perfectly planned expedition. It's probably because his trip journal was so boring. To begin with, it seemed quite cold, but one gets used to anything.
farther out there and okay. get him on the board this side so we can roll him. Sorry to, um, you know, startle you with this. We're going to Ushuaia. We're, I'll be going to the hospital and uh, be evaluated there. I love you very much. And I'll be seeing you sooner than we expected. Dear all, last night as the LMG was sailing into the Drake Passage, the ship took an unexpected heavy roll. This launched me from my upper bunk to the floor below, greatly surprising Frank and causing extensive damage to my body. My season is certainly over. I would like to ask my project participants to take my place starring in these videos. Frank will continue to Palmer Station and await your arrival. P.S. I'm in good shape for the shape I'm in. <laughs>